How important is your mother? Is your mother the best woman you'll ever meet? Mine certainly is. If I told you someone took the life of their mother, what would you think? On August the 19th, 2005, Esme Tang would insert a knife into her mother in a grisly manner and forever change the trajectory of her life and her family's life. On the same eerie day, she posted her final entry to her online diary. She fashioned an anklet earlier that day and gave it to her mother. A memorable parting gift, no doubt. The honor student from Overland Park, Kansas, who was 16 years old at the time, documented in an earlier entry that it made her feel so infantile just trying to live up to her parents' expectations. She had been attempting to lighten their spirits and remove herself from their list of worries by making them smile. Ten days later, she fatally knifed her mother in an episode that presumably involved both the mother and daughter going through various parts of their house. While Esme chased her mother who struggled back, her death was already destined. The Tang family's pleasant middle-class neighborhood in Middle America was shocked by the murder. Esme was considered one of the state's top young classical pianists. She excelled in school. She participated in physical competitions and was a member of the debate team. She was a kid any parent would be proud of, said a local father named Jacob Horwitz. Of course, further investigations revealed a much more disturbing story. There were too many expectations set on her young shoulders. The night she was detained, on August 19, 2005, according to Mr. Horwitz, the local priest is when he first learned of her actions. After learning on the evening news that she had been imprisoned in connection with the death of her mother, Chu Yi Zhang, age 55. Horwitz recalled that his son and daughter had gone to summer camp with Esme. They had met a nice youngster who was friendly and sweet. They couldn't believe it was the same person. According to Horwitz, his kids didn't hang around with folks who were frequently in problems. One is forced to wonder if she ever pondered over the impact she would go on to leave on all the lives of those who knew her. When Mr. Horwitz searched online for more information, he discovered Esme's three-year-old blog. He then spent the next two or three hours going through her website. He felt there was much more than what was reported in the news as soon as he finished reading. Esme had struggled for years with her affection for her Chinese immigrant parents, who she claimed had impossible demands for her. She said that they had threatened to sell her piano if she didn't take first place in a statewide tournament. The very skill they had been ingraining into her since childhood was now becoming a source of misery for her. It was seeds of doubt and mistrust that would eventually unleash. In her online entries, she claimed that because of her 96% on an exam, they had grounded her. She further said that they made her stand in a corner naked after she let them down. She had written about her disdain for them, especially her mother, in her diary, as did many young girls. Jacob Horwitz recalls reading her blog and thinking, my God, it's bad another parent didn't see this. It is an appeal for help. Chu Yi Zhang, the mother, died from several stab wounds and the crime scene appeared to have stretched into several rooms of the house. Investigators uncovered some horrifying information and Johnson County District Attorney Paul Morrison moved to have Esme tried in adult court. When Johnson County District Attorney Paul Morrison successfully argued that Esme should be tried as an adult rather than a juvenile, he was astounded. Horowitz, on the other hand, was mortified. He argued that American society is aware that children develop at varying rates. He claims that because they are children, the juvenile justice system is in place. On March the 6th, 2006, one month and one day before turning 17, Esme entered a plea of guilty to voluntary manslaughter in an adult court. After her sentencing hearing, the prosecution and defense both agreed to recommend a term of 100 months or little under eight and a half years. What do you think of this sentence? Because when I read 100 months, I think I've slept longer than that. According to research, 
Esme was too old to be detained in a juvenile detention facility because she was over 15 when she committed her crime. Instead, she was likely to be transported to the Topeka Correctional Facility for women to fulfill a sentence. She would be the youngest prisoner there, according to Mr. Horwitz, and he was concerned for her safety. While Esme spent hours wondering where her fate would take her, she did not know that she had begun to amass silent calls for prayers from community members. There were a sea of people who were visibly disturbed and ached to tell the girl that she had suffered. When he discovered Esme's online journal on livejournal.com using the name Rock On Little One, it all started for him following her arrest. He devoured Esme's writings over three years in a three-hour reading marathon. By the time he was finished, Horwitz had the impression that he knew the girl better than his children. Esme's persona appeared to embrace him from the screen. Tang was praised by several of her classmates as a bright, outgoing and talented pianist who might have played professionally. Tang was a member of the gifted program and an honor roll student. Her praises as a notable musician bring to mind the scathing remarks about her mother who threatened to once take it away. The principal of her school stated that the initial reaction was probably more astonishment followed by grief. Now I know this Horwitz character is a priest so he might look at this in a more favorable light, in a more forgiving light and maybe the pressure they put on Esme was very strong. There's more details to come that suggest it was strong but that doesn't justify what she did, surely. For her brief encounter to have been so profound once again forces us to wonder how her actions in public defied those she committed at home. More than 100 comments were left on one of Tang's blogs, most of which were supportive remarks from friends. As expected, some remarks were filthy, inconsiderate and disparaging. But what do you expect? Duh. Releasing that a barbaric event was becoming a sensationalist story for the masses, a friend decided to intervene and put a stop to this. One of Tang's close pals finally took down her entries. On condition of anonymity, one of her friends spoke up and said Esme's name had been made into a joke, and it disturbed them to hear how she was being remembered. The acquaintance denied Tang's erratic conduct, drug usage, and Friday early dismissal from school, as several had suggested. A large portion of Esme's online writing is reminiscent of the diaries of any other snarky, music-loving, fervently social kid venturing into the internet. But after her atrocious murder, one can't help but view her postings in a new light. Esme customized a Zanga.com profile to reflect her grumpy adolescent pout. The words, sometimes I wonder whether I have a mental disorder, are pasted over the heads of two expressionless models in the background. She further lamented about how she was afraid that if she told anyone about her fears and worries, then she'd have to face them. She did her best to pretend to be normal. Her fatalistic livejournal.com diatribe about the purpose of life revealed her distraught state of mind. In a post dated February the 9th, 2004, Esme went on a tirade about the human race. She wrote about how the human race would perish. Everybody and everything is transient. Regardless of whether you are right or wrong, a person would still die. While this nihilistic attitude was a desperate cry for help, it sadly went unheard. Through postings and comments that direct readers to other people's websites, networks like Jenga and LiveJournal bring people together, Esme's friends discovered that after Zhang's passing, that a large audience of total strangers was reading every post she had made. Esme's online journals were eventually made private by a friend, but not before parts of her writing appeared on other websites and in newspapers. In elementary and middle school, Katie Jones, Sarah Casey and Amelia Mallet were members of Esme's old group of friends. These were Esme's close buddies, her overnight companions and her inside joke companions. They were familiar with Esme back when she wrote in her journals before she lost all sense of who she was. They were familiar with all of Esme's quirky characteristics such as how one of her eyes is slightly darker than the other or how she always popped her joints before night. Esme would enter a room and make self-deprecating jokes about her appearance, making fun of her Asian origin and the cultural stereotype of overachievers 
And the irony in all this is while she was crying for help on the internet, she finally got it. It just took her mother's life to get it. They claim she was a big hugger, but also a snappy one when she didn't agree with someone. Esme never attempted to conceal her intelligence while she was a two-year member of the high school honor roll. Her intellect was entirely devoted to organization and atomization, and she appeared to never forget anything she had learned. Amelia claims that Esme developed a greater obsession with time. Esme would empty and tidy up Sarah's bag if it was disorganized. Stretch marks began to appear around her new muscles after she began working out for hours at a time. Her vast Zanga buddy list was meticulously maintained. If she made new friends, they would be added to the list in its proper place. Her dominating parents caused her to feel the need to dominate her environment. Esme claimed in a live journal blog she published that winter that her parents had threatened to leave since she had received three B's on an otherwise A-field report. She wrote on her blog how scared she was with these less than perfect grades. She feared them and their reaction. Anything less than perfect would force her to lie to them. She wondered if these grades would result in her losing all her confidence. She ended the message with the word HELP in large inch high letters. The four friends once spent weeks organizing a sleepover but on the night of the event, Esme sobbed when she dialed their numbers from her home. It was unusual for her to cry. Esme crept down the stairway to a landing where she could look into the room where her parents were yelling at each other in Chinese while Sarah listened. According to Sarah, Esme witnessed her mother th while holding a knife to her throat. Esme was able to join her pals at Sarah's home later that evening after receiving a ride from her father. She initially appeared a little shaken but subsequently pretended nothing had happened. Esme's family relocated to the Blue Valley School District from North Johnson County when she was in middle school. Esme left her classmates from sleepovers behind at Blue Valley North High School. A new group of friends streaked their hair, painted mascara rings around their eyes, went out late at night and smoked cigarettes at Oak Park Mall. On their Zanga sites, inside jokes frequently referenced drugs. Using their digital cameras, they shared self-portraits online while experimenting with sensual faces. Esme was pals with a lot of doubtful people, and one has to wonder if she felt even more lost among them. Old friends of Esme recall her family as being fiercely protective of their sole child. Esme's dad had to make sure that the household pets were well behaved before she could go to friends' houses. Her buddies perform a voice impersonation of her mother yelling her name. According to her pals, her parents ascribed their issues to her. When Esme's mother lost her job at Sprint, she berated Esme saying it was her fault she couldn't retire. According to Katie, Esme would frequently discover typed, hand-signed notes from her mother on her computer screen. According to Katie, one note said that Esme was a disappointment, she was lazy, and that she was ashamed to have her as a daughter. According to others who have spoken with her father, he partially attributes the violence in his home to demons. The day it occurred also happened to be the Ghost Festival, a traditional Chinese holiday, when ghosts and spirits are thought to visit the living. In addition, he has told close acquaintances that the men in his family all have poor luck at the age of 58 due to his superstition over his age. He needed two months before he made a statement requesting Esme to be tried as a juvenile. He showed up for the following court hearings after missing Esme's initial hearing. He reclined on the bench with his eyes closed, avoiding glances and inquiries. He leaned on a cane and appeared frail, as though a strong wind could topple him. Family acquaintances claimed that selling Esme's piano was one of the first things he did after his wife's passing. But in the darkness, all her friends and family were now merely memories. Horowitz was a friend to her, one that she didn't know she had. He later told reporters that he was drawn to Esme's case because he saw similarities between her and his children, who he described as responsible, diligent students. He was astounded by Esme's posts, maturity and global perspective as he read her diary. Her maturity and intellect were evident from her writings and like most folks, he too 
was drawn by this surreal story. It truly makes us wonder how no lawyer could find anyone to say anything negative about her that she took her mother's life. Does that speak for itself? Horowitz later pondered how one day it could have been the child of any of those parents. On a Friday night, they make one poor choice while out with pals and it could have been their kid's name as the victim. What troubled everyone was that the juvenile justice system was designed for children that Esme, who was one of the community's children, did not deserve to be imprisoned with adult offenders. Horowitz read her posts and came to certain conclusions. He claimed that she wanted to be a good kid and please her parents. He stressed how even her SATs and getting good grades were on her mind while she was detained. She had a battle with her mother and lost it because she was under so much strain. That's what the public assumed. Theoretically speaking, one can imagine she was in the kitchen when she and her mother got into a quarrel and whether it was once or 50 times, for 5 minutes she transformed from a sweet, calm, picture perfect little Asian girl and goes in a raging frenzy. And there are various ways to interpret this. And if this is indeed what happened, there ought to be repercussions. The Johnson County Courthouse was jam-packed on September the 13th for Esme's first public court appearance. Horwitz, a father of three, was one of the many people present. When she led out into the courtroom, it wasn't an adult that walked out. A small, trembling, shivering girl came out and was suddenly up for questioning. Some folks got together to help ensure she tried as a juvenile. The organization's goal was to keep the 16-year-old's case in the juvenile system to allow Tang to be tried as an adult for first-degree murder, the district attorney's office submitted a motion to waive her juvenile status. If found guilty, the penalty would have been a minimum of 25 years. According to the prosecutor Paul Morrison, it was fairly usual for them to submit a waiver along with the charges in a case of intentional homicide with a child who was beyond the age of 15. That would allow them numerous options for trial or reaching a deal with those involved. But despite the hiccups in the case, the district attorney had already made up his mind when he learned of Esme's actions. Paul Morrison had very little sympathy. He told the BBC that one could certainly argue that she is one to be feared given her potential for violence, and he claimed it was proper for her to do her time in an adult prison. Murdering her mother with a butcher knife was too much for everyone to ignore. Nothing could justify the level of brutality exhibited and on that note many agreed. According to him, he pushed for the teenager to be tried as an adult to make sure she served substantial time in jail. There was no assurance she wouldn't be released in six months in juvenile court. It's different from the adult system. She is required to complete 85% of her punishment. So where is she now? Well, there haven't been a lot of updates about her since she was released in 2012. However, an active LinkedIn profile of Esme Teng exists. If it is to believe, then she was able to build a name for herself for the better, I assume. Personally, I completely disagree with the sentence. Look what she did to her mother. Okay, I know her mother pressured her. I can only imagine her mother shouting at her, fighting with her. You have to get these grades. Uh, her mother blaming her daughter for her mother's financial difficulties or whatever it may be. I can see all of that. I get it. It's abusive and all that stuff. But none of that justifies getting a knife and putting it inside your mother. Are you insane? What's wrong with you? We can argue, yeah, she needed help. If only people reached out to her from seeing her online postings, etc. But there's no way you can justify her actions. I've been there myself. When you don't get along with your parents, you're a teenager, you're still trying to figure out what you want in life, you're trying to figure out who you are. Some people in their 30s, 40s, 50s still don't figure out who they are or what they want to do. Therefore, the effect on Esme, on her mental well-being, well that makes sense. Her mother making her feel like she's not good enough, she's not worth it, she looks at her friends, her friends seem happy, don't really have many problems with their parents, why me, why me, why me, right? We've all been there. But the fact that she was released in 2012, that does not sit right with me. Why don't you guys comment, tell me what you think.